Hey, before we get to our passage for the day, um, I just want to welcome uh, the folks that are joining us online. Uh, blessing to have you here with us. I hope you're blessed as well. We are in the middle of a huge uh, building preservation project. Uh, if you'd like to participate in the ministry, if you'd like to bless us, if you'd like to contribute, uh, or if you'd like us to pray for you, there'll be a way to do that at the end of the sermon. So just hang on till the end. We'll tell you how you can be part of what we're doing here at Warrington Bible Fellowship. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to turn to Exodus chapter 20. We're going to be in verses 12 through 13 today. Why don't you stand while we read this? If, if you can't stand for a long time, it's okay. Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. The word of the Lord, brothers and sisters, have a seat. My mom, um, beautiful woman, she didn't know the Ten Commandments. I, I mean, if you said, hey, mom, could you recite the Ten Commandments? She would go, oh, I know the Ten Commandments. But I'll tell you, she knew at least one of them. Um, <laughs> and she was not hesitating to remind me, obey your parents. Um, that was a, you know, the Bible says John Allen. That's what she called me. So if you want to really get under my skin, the uh, obey your parents. And th there was the implication that God was going to be mad at me if I didn't do that. I lived in terror for a long time trying to figure out what all this meant. So we've got, we've got two commandments here. Obey your parents, we think, and you shall not kill, we think. Sounds pretty good. Sounds like a lot of the things we've been taught. Question for this morning, is that true? Is that what these are saying? Are they saying obey your parents and don't kill anybody? That's what we're trying to explore here. So, you know, for a lot of us, maybe you haven't had a similar experience, but for a lot of us, the commandments have kind of been seared into our mind. Uh, at least a few of them have. And we're, we're trying to look at them a little bit differently, um, not looking at them at, at, as a list of do's and don'ts. Um, you know, and if, if you start to think about it, if, if we think they're a list of do's and don'ts, it, that's really about us, isn't it? about how we can be better Christians, how we can maybe curry God's favor, uh, how we can tell the good guys from the bad guys, about how we behave if they're just a bunch of do's and don'ts. Well, we now know that the scriptures are about God. They're not about us. So we want to take a close enough look at the Ten Commandments to see what they say about him. So this is the heart of God, part three. And let me give you a quick review so far. Uh, at the core of everything that we've seen, the first commandment, he is the one true God. The second, he alone is worthy of worship. The third, he, God, is holy. And the fourth one, he is creator of all things. Now, if you look a little closer at these, you're going to find out, and we'll go through this starting next week, how they build upon one another. Each one gives us a little bit more to know about who God is, his character and nature. Today, we're going to look at the fifth and sixth commandments. And these, these two are probably what I consider to be the tricky ones because they can so easily be misunderstood, misinterpreted. And, it, you know, in doing that, it can do a lot of damage to our view of who God is. It can do a lot of damage to our relationships with other people. It can even be harmful to us, as we'll see. So we need a better understanding of our Father in heaven if we're going to understand these two commandments. Let's take a look at commandment number five, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that your Lord, your God, is giving you. Now, I want that to say that if I, if I honor my mother and father, I'll live a long time. I won't be sick. That's not the intention here. This is the only command that comes with a promise. The Jews would not have taken this literally. They would have seen it as something of a proverb. They would have understood it to say that 
you will have peace and joy while you're alive if you honor your parents. It's a, it's a word of wisdom. It's not necessarily a guarantee. Uh, it, what it's saying is if you do this, all things in, in the general sense will go well for you. So the Jewish culture was characterized by a deep sense of honor and shame. Those who were honorable, those who were honored were given respect. Those who were shamed were treated as outcasts. There were two extremes. These cultures are based on the concept of pride and honor. And if you look at the history, this is the dominant cultural aspect of everything from the Mideast all the way over to Asia. Even, even being associated with somebody who was one or the other kind of rubbed off on you. Uh, so, and and the, the core value here was they, they, they valued a person's actions, his behavior, more than anything else. Uh, a shameful act could cause embarrassment, could cause a loss of pride. Now, these civilizations, uh, these cultures all had some things in common. And here, here the, the, there was a shared honor what one person does can bring honor to his family, to his village, to his tribe. We've talked about that several times, even his nation. There were very early teachings. This teaching started early. Children were taught from a young age how to bring honor to their family. That's bring honor to their village, bring honor uh, to their tribe, bring honor to their nation. There was an extreme community loyalty involved in this. People are expected to be loyal to their community, even if it was at great personal cost. Community came first. And the final defining characteristic was there was an incredible sense of revenge, a dynamic that, uh, against anyone who wounds someone, who wounds their pride, or causes dishonor to come to them. They would gather together. So we recognize that even in the cultures today. In the Jewish culture, those who honored others were seen as godly and pious. They, they, while those who acted shamefully were seen as ungodly. Now, all this shows up in how the Jews view their relationship with God, who is the epitome of honor, the epitome of the one who is to receive honor. God is holy and honorable. He is kind and gracious. He is merciful and forgiving until he's not. Until he's not. Whoa. Well, if he's not all those things, God being honorable must have a pretty good reason for not expressing those things, even if that reason isn't readily seen. So that, that mode of thinking became the bedrock for Jewish theology. And it basically went like this. If things go well for you, God was blessing you. You were being honored. If things were going bad for you, well, you must have done something to earn that bad treatment. We see this all the way through the book of Job. And, and that would cause you to be shamed. And being shamed had to be avoided at all costs. See, they saw God not just as honorable, but as worthy of honor in all of the aspects of their relationship with him. So scripture tells us that God is worthy of honor. Now remember that phrase, worthy of honor. In Revelation 4.11, worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and what? Honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. So if the creator, follow me on this, is honorable, and he chooses not to honor you, you must be doing something unhonorable. That was their reasoning. So what I want you to see so far is that God is worthy of honor and that those he makes, those he creates, are worthy of honor, not, not by any virtue that they have, by virtue of who created them. And by honor, listen carefully, we mean respect and dignity. Respect and dignity are afforded to those that God creates. Now, let's all this, add this into the mix of the fact that the cultures back in that day were agrarian. 
They lived off their crops. They lived off their livestock. That required the collective work of a family. It could expand beyond that eventually, but it starts with the family. And the family works together to harvest the crops, take care of the livestock. They need the community to be able to trade and barter and sell. The community needs a tribe to be able to do these transactions. The tribe needs a nation and so on and so forth. So the family was dependent upon their community. And the communities integrated into the tribe that lived in that location in that area, all of them working for each other's welfare and care. If the family breaks down, if that family unit fails, it can be disastrous to a whole lot of people because it can bring shame. Shame to the family, the village, and so on and so forth. Of course, now, where did we get this concept of the family from? It didn't just rise up out of nowhere. The concept of the family began with God, who created the first father and mother. Anybody know their names? No. Okay. That'll be on the final. <laughs> so he created the father and mother, and he gave them children. God gave them children. We see this when Eve has Seth, Genesis 4, 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. So the family unit is ordained by God. God has created the family, and because he is honorable, he expects us to honor the family and structure that he created. You follow me on that? Making sense so far? Thank you. I struggled all week with this. All that is going around a long way to say this. God wants us all to honor our father and mother because they are the head of the family that he created. That's what this means. Let me tell you what it doesn't mean. A lot of folks have turned this into a, a do or a don't, a legalist way of trying to make this work somehow. And in so doing, they've tried to make honor, they've tried to make honor mean obey. Ooh. I mean, isn't that the gist of what we were taught? That we need to obey our parents? It's not the word used here in the fifth commandment. We are to honor our parents the same way we're told, listen carefully, to honor those in authority over us. Now I know I got some of your attentions. <laughs> our honor for them, for our parents, for those who are in authority over us, becomes a display of our honor for God who created them and us. We honor those in the authority, not by obeying everything they say, but by giving them respect, by affording them some dignity. In the same way we're called to honor our folks, we can show honor without carte blanche obedience. This is not what this is calling for. Now, let's talk about children, because if there are any children listening right now, they're going, I don't have to listen to mom and dad. <laughs> this is pretty good. Listen to me carefully on this. They are called to obey their folks. Ephesians 6, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your mother and father. This is the first commandment with a promise. Then it may go well with you, and you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So children, indeed, are called to obey their folks. Now, we can spend a long time debating at what age children become adults. Okay, and I'm not here to answer that, but I will tell you this. If you are living at home, go ask your parents. Now think about that one for a minute. But for now, I want to spend some time talking about adults and their relationship with their parents. Honoring our mom and dad may be easy for those who have a healthy and happy relationship with them. And there are many of us among here who do. But not everyone has that. 
You hear what I'm saying? Not everybody has that happy, healthy relationship with their folks. Not everyone has parents who are believers. We don't, we, we don't all have parents who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So we have to be careful because this does not mean we have to obey them. Now, I'm not saying that we should rise up and oppose them. There should be no act of rebellion in us. We have to find a way to honor them without doing everything that they tell us to do. Particularly if they want us to do something that, that dishonors God, particularly if obeying them becomes abusive. Let's be honest. There are times when some parents have been manipulative and abusive and controlling. Does this commandment mean that we just got to suffer through that and, and endure all of that? No, this, this is why it says honor and not obey. The word for honor means to weigh heavily. It, it has a connotation to, uh, to have high regard for, to respect. And what this commandment is telling us is that we should always respect our parents. We should always have some regard for them. So if we choose not to obey, we have to do it with respect and with a measure of high regard. We don't disagree out of anger. We don't disagree out of fear. We're not trying to get back at them. We're not trying to show them anything. As adults, we can respectfully, compassionately, reverently disagree and then make our own decision, which we are responsible to God for. In other words, what I'm trying to say is there's no moment in which we go, I don't have to listen to you. I don't have to do that. Think about how this might bleed into your other relationships in life. We should try to listen. We just don't listen to them and refuse to listen to God. God's always a priority. God and his word are always our guide in these things. For those struggling souls that feel trapped in an abusive situation, you may have to honor them from a distance. It's okay. It means not, you know, how do we do that? You know, what happens? How do, I, how do I honor them without standing in front of them? Well, you can honor them by not doting on their behavior, by not bad-mouthing them, by not going to all of your friends and saying, hey, look, this is, what, this is what happened, and this is how it happened, by not getting angry at them, but by respecting them for who they are, And the truth of the matter is, they're the ones who gave you life and ultimately honoring the one who gave them life when we honor them. You see the hand of God in this commandment? God is worthy of honor, our honor. Our parents, now maybe some of you haven't thought about your parents this way, but our parents who God gave us are worthy of honor because... God ordained them to be our parents. We respect them, not because of who they are, but because of the office that they hold because of their position in our lives. And that goes true whether you've got a good relationship or a bad relationship with them. We're called to honor them, but our obedience is first to our Father in heaven. God gave us our parents so that Through our honoring them, the world could see that the one who gave them to us is worthy of honor. It's our fifth commandment. God is worthy of honor. Look at the sixth commandment. You shall not murder. You know, it's funny. In the Hebrew language, this commandment only has two words. It's equivalent of never murder. Never murder. A lot of confusion, a lot of heartache over misunderstanding of how to translate these two words, how they should be interpreted. Much comes from how the King James Version translates the words. It says, thou shalt not kill. 
Now, all manner of doctrine has risen up because of this translation. Some people decide because of it not to fight in wars, because you've got to kill people, fight in wars. Even others believe that animals should not be slaughtered. Some people believe uh, that not a lot of them think nothing should ever be killed. I have a lady who's friend on Facebook that swears up and down that every time you cut a flower, it screams, and that we should not be killing flowers. But some people think nothing should be killed. Humans, animals, no fish, no bugs, not even mosquitoes, no plants. I'm not sure what those folks eat. There must be something. Some people think it's a prohibition against capital punishment. But see, this is what happens when we begin to take the Scriptures too literally, neglect to take into consideration of the whole Bible. Because if we allow ourselves to think that God prohibits the killing of other human beings in all cases, including war, including civil cases, forget about the plants and everything else, well, if we think that's what that says, God's got some explaining to do, doesn't he? I mean, we've got, we've got to be looking at the rest of the Bible to see what's going on here. People like King David are in trouble, not just because of what happened with Bathsheba, but because he was a warrior. He killed Goliath. He killed Philistines. He was a murderer and a warrior. Joshua and the entire Hebrew army are in trouble for executing thousands of people as they occupy the Holy Land. Think about this. The stonings prescribed by the law that we're in the middle of in, in, in Leviticus and Numbers and here in Deuteronomy, would show God to be commanding people to sin. Killings of all kinds were prohibited. The priests who did the sacrifices would be in trouble because they had to kill the animals. And if all that's true, Jesus, who ordered the disciples to ready the, the Passover supper and kill a lamb, Jesus would be in trouble. <laughs> He'd be just as guilty as a priest. So clearly, the idea that God prohibits killing is somewhat lacking when it comes to the spirit and intent of the law. The fact of the matter is, when the King James was written, the Hebrew word resa meant to kill. But back then, it was, that word was more often used to indicate Murder. Why the new translations say murder. Back then, it didn't have the same meaning as it does today. So the original readers of the King James probably understood exactly what was going on here, but were interpreted in the context of the culture of our time. So it should be a caution to us to be careful in assuming that readers in ancient times were thinking the same thing we're thinking when we read this stuff. That's one of the reasons that one of the first things that we try and do when we bring a message here is to try our best to determine authorial intent. What did the original author intend to say and what were his readers hearing when he said it? This is a prime example of that. Because in this context, rasa means killing for selfish reasons, without divine authorization. That's how the Jews would have understood this, because they would have put it into the context of the rest of the law. There's also the inference of premeditated murder here, and murder is the operative word. So that would exclude divinely appointed holy wars. It would exclude divinely ordained executions. In other words, if God prescribes this clearly in Scripture, with all the detail we see in the Old Testament, then it's not murder. Now, what does that tell us about God? Well, we've kind of been leading up to this with the other commandments. God is the creator of life. We see this in Genesis 2. This is where things start getting interesting. God created he made this pile of dirt, and he made it in the form of a man, and he leaned over it, and he breathed into it, and it came to life. 
All of a sudden, there's life in this dirt because of what God's done. God is the creator of life. We see in Psalm 139 that he created all living things. Listen to this, Psalm 139, 13. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Think about that. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, written. And every one of them, the days were of my life were written before they were, I'm sorry, written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was not one of them. So God not only is a creator of life, he's not only the giver of life, he is the extender of life. He formed us in the womb. He gave us life. And then we've got something really amazing if you look at John's gospel. In John 14, 6, I am the way, Jesus says, listen to this. I am the way, the truth, and what? The life. God is not only the creator of life, he is life. Bake on this for a bit. Consider this. There is no life without God. God creates life, and he is life. And as we saw in Genesis 2, he made a man out of this dirt and gave him life. He made a woman out of the man's rib. That, that, that's equally as spectacular. We saw it again in, in, in uh, earlier in, in the sermon here, that he formed each of us in the womb, gave us life. Now we see that the life he gives, he is. God is life. That should be an arrow to our hearts. Think about this. See if it comes to you. Because it's the root of the gospel. God is life. He gave us life. He shares himself with us. Giving us life, he shares himself with us. If we reject him, if we deny him, we reject life. Scripture tells us the life that we reject is eternal life with him in heaven. Eternal life with the God who gave us the life that we have. So he not only gave us life, he determines its length. He not only initiates life, he ordains our days, every one of them. He is sovereign over all of it. So watch this. If someone intentionally takes the life of another, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on there. If someone commits murder, from an eternal perspective, what they're doing is saying, God may give life, but I'm going to be the one that takes it. Murder denies God's sovereignty. It pretends to take his place. It says, God does not ordain your days. I do. You see that murder is an attempt to become God? Sixth commandment tells us that God is the giver of life and his life is self, and we are not. So let's take a look at the fifth commandment again. God is worthy of honor, and so are his institutions. And as we honor them, we honor him. We respectfully, reverently honor our parents so that we can show the world that God is worthy of honor because he made them. Our parents, like each of us, are imperfect human beings, don't tell my kids that. They sometimes do not handle things well. Amen. For some, they are, were a beautiful relationship. For others, they were a very difficult relationship. Yet either way, we're told to respect them. We're not here to subject ourselves to ungodly or painful treatment, but we can respect them if they're near, and we can respect them from a distance if need be. Sixth commandment, God's a giver of life. The amazing thing about murder, chew on this one for a bit, talk about it over lunch. 
Murder doesn't thwart God's plan. God's not sitting in heaven going, well, I didn't see that coming. I mean, who let this happen? I had planned for that person to live for another X number of years, and look what this person over here has done. God's not taken by surprise by murder. The murder is not more powerful than God, and neither is the murderer. He doesn't ruin God's plan. Our struggle with murder is this. To us, it, it's brutal. And it's so heinous, so unexpected, so final, that we have a hard time dealing with it. God's got it under control. You know what Joseph said when he finally confronted his brothers in Egypt after they tried to sell him into slavery? Is you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In some mysterious way, I don't get it. God will use even murder to accomplish his plan. The loss is still painful to us. Our grief is still real. But there is at least hope. Hope that God is still on the throne. He remains in control. He's still sovereign. So is this true? It, are we to uh, obey our folks? Or is killing evil? Well, those are questions that I think God leaves us up to decide individually uh, about the obedience to our parents and, and this whole killing issue. But those are not the commandments. It's not what we're told here. Neither one of those statements tells us anything about God. As we have seen, it's easy to misinterpret Scripture. So what we need to understand is that what this commandment says is that we owe God our life. He's the creator of life. He gives us life. And as we saw in the Gospel of John, he does that through his son, Jesus Christ. So life isn't a gift that we've been given. In many ways, it is. Life is God. He shares himself with us. He draws us unto him. He begins to conform us to his image begins to make us into the ambassadors and the messengers that we're supposed to be. And all that happens because he gave himself to us on the cross. He sacrificed his only son on the cross so that we could enter into this incredible, miraculous relationship with him. And the deeper we get into that relationship, the more we are to understand that we are to honor God in everything that we do, we not only honor the life that he's given, we honor the parents he's given. And, you know, if you can start there, then you can begin to honor all the other people around you as well. We can honor and respect people. In a season, in an election season, where there's all this vitriol floating around, all this anger and everything, we can respect people. We can, we can regard them highly without agreeing with them, without arguing with them, without bowing down to them, trying to obey them. I'd like to ask the deacons to come forward for communion. Think about these things. I'll tell you something. This is the issue that I've struggled with all week long, trying to understand exactly what this commandment about murder is. And the deeper I got into it, the more it affected my heart. And it, it makes me look at things around me a little bit differently. Now we have this opportunity to do this together, to go before the Lord and say, what are you saying to my heart right now? It might not be about honor. It might not be about, uh, about murder. But it might be about whatever God is doing in your heart. He gives us these times as we come together to go before him and say, Lord, what would you have me do? How would you touch my heart today? So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. We're going to hand out the, the elements. We'll hand out the bread. We'll take it together. Then we'll hand out the juice. We'll take it together at home. If you'd like to prepare uh, something to eat and something to drink, then you'll be able to join us with communion. Thank you.
Father, we thank you for that incredible moment when Jesus held up the bread and said, this is my body. That's just a precursor to what he was about to do. He's about to offer up his body and sacrifice for us who are dead in our sin. A sacrifice that would bring his life into ours. Oh, we thank you for that sacrifice, Father. We thank you for that life we receive. We thank you for who you are and how you move in our lives. And we thank you for the opportunity to be here, Lord, to honor you. And we pray, Father, that you give us a fortitude, a commitment to honor those around us as a reflection of how we honor you. Take an eat. Father, he didn't stop there with the body. Jesus held out the cup and said, this is my blood. Oh, they didn't get it at that moment, but they were about to see what you were doing. We thank you for the body that brings us into your presence, the blood that cleanses us. We thank you for this opportunity to look back on what you've done, to participate in what you're doing, and to look forward to what you will do according to your promises. We thank you for that precious blood, Lord. That blood that would wash us clean. That blood that will one day wash away every evil deed we've done, every sin we've committed, every evil thought that we've had, every time that we have not listened to you, every time that we have not obeyed you, that will restore us completely and perfectly in glory as we stand before you forever. We thank you for the blood that cleanses us and the body that brings us into your presence. Take and drink. Lord, we give you praise. We give you thanks. Father, we stand together today as your body. We stand with our brothers and sisters in other churches that name your name as Lord and Savior. And we look forward to that day when we will be united in your presence before you forever, singing with the angels, holy, holy, holy. It is in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
Thank you for joining us online. Thank you for this morning. If anybody would like to talk, I'll be standing right over here. Hi, Pastor John here. Thanks for joining us. If you were blessed by the service, let me ask you to do us a favor. Would you click on the like button below, the little thumbs up? If you're listening on Sermon Audio, perhaps you can comment or even share the sermon with someone else. We'd love to hear from you. We're on Facebook and YouTube at WBFVA and on the World Wide Web at WBFVA.org. Let us know if you'd like us to pray for you. We'd love the opportunity. If you'd like to support us financially or to make a donation to our Building Preservation Fund, you can do that through our website at wbfva.org and by clicking on Giving. Of course, you can send a check to Warrenton Bible Fellowship, 46 Winchester Street, Warrenton, Virginia, 20186. You'll receive a tax-deductible receipt either way at the end of the year. If you'd like to contact me personally, you can email me at kavakas, that's K-U-V-A-K-A-S, at gmail.com. I'm also on Facebook and Instagram under John Kavakas. Either way, we'd love to hear from you. Or even if you have the opportunity to visit us in person one Sunday, we'd love to see you. We meet at 46 Winchester Street in downtown Warrington at 11 a.m. every Sunday morning. And now may God bless you richly until we gather again.